all sitting comfortably. Not really, no. But sure, why not? <laughs> Look, you're in the best fucking seat in the house. <laughs> yes. Stop your fucking whinging and just okay. enjoy just story time with stone. Owl Creek by Elizabeth Margaret O'Hara. A man stood upon a railroad bridge in northern Alabama, looking down into the swift water twenty feet below. The man's hands were behind his back, the wrists bound with a cord. A rope closely encircled his neck. It was attached to a stout cross timber above his head, and the slack fell to the level of his knees. Some loose boards laid upon the ties supporting the rails of the railway supplied a footing for him and his executioner's two private soldiers. Directed by a sergeant who in civil life may have been a deputy sheriff, but a short remove upon the same temporary platform was an officer in the uniform of his rank, an armed. He was a captain, a sentinel, at each end of the bridge, stood with his rifle in the position known as support. That is to say, vertical in front of the left shoulder. Hammer resting on the forearm, thrown straight across the chest. A formal and fucking unnatural position. Forcing an erect carriage of the body that is not fucking comfortable, I can tell. It did not appear to be the duty of these two men to know what the fuck was occurring at the centre of the bridge. They were merely there to blockade the two ends of the foot planking that traversed it. Beyond one of the sentinels, nobody was in sight. The railroad ran straight away into a forest for a hundred yards or so, and then curving was lost to view. Doubtless there was an outpost farther along, and the other bank of the stream was open ground, a gentle slope topped with a stockade of vertical tree trunks. Loopholes for rifles with a single embrasure through which protruded the muzzle of a brass cannon. That was commanding the bridge. Midway up the slope between the bridge and the fall were the spectators. A single company of infantry, infantry in the line. The lieutenant stood at the right of the line, the point of his sword upon the ground, his left hand resting upon his right. Expecting the group before at the centre of the bridge, not a man moved. The company faced the bridge, staring stonily, motionless. The sentinels facing the banks of the stream might have been fucking statues to adorn the bridge. The captain stood with folded arms, observing it all. Death is a dignitary who, when he comes, announced is to be received. The man who was engaged in being hanged was about 35 years of age. He was a civilian, if one might judge from his habit, which was that of a planter. His features were good, a straight nose, firm mouth, broad forehead, from which his long, dark hair was combed straight, falling behind his ears to the collar of his well-fitting frock coat. He wore a moustache, a pointed beard, but no whiskers. His eyes were large and dark grey, and had a kindly expression, which one would hardly have expected in one whose neck was in a fucking rope. This was no vulgar assassin. Preparations being complete, the two private soldiers stepped aside and each nodded to the captain, saluted and placed himself immediately behind the officer, who in turn moved apart one pace. Even these movements left the condemned man and the sergeant standing on the two ends of the same plank, which spanned three of the cross ties of the bridge. The end upon which the civilian stood almost, but not quite, reaching a fourth plank. This plank had been held in place by the weight of the captain. It was now held by that of the sergeant. At a signal from the former, the latter would step aside. The plank would tilt and the condemned man would go down between the two tides. The arrangement 
commended itself to his judgment. A simple and effective solution. His face had not been covered, nor his eyes bandaged. He looked for a moment at his unsteadfast footing, then let his gaze wander to the swirling water of the stream, racing madly beneath his feet. A piece of dancing driftwood caught his attention, and his eyes followed it down the current. How slowly it appeared to move. What a sluggish stream. He closed his eyes in order to fix his last thoughts upon his wife and children. The water, touched to gold by the early sun, brewed in mists under the banks at some distance down the stream. The fort, the soldier, the piece of a drift, all had distracted him. And now, he became conscious of a new disturbance. Striking through the thought of his dear ones was a sound which he could neither ignore nor understand, a sharp, distinct, metallic percussion, like the stroke of a blacksmith's hammer upon the anvil. He wondered what it was, and whether immeasurably distant or nearby. It seemed both at the same fucking time. Its recurrence was regular, but as slow as the tolling of a death knell. He awaited each new stroke with impatience, and he knew not why, but apprehension. The intervals of silence grew progressively longer. They hurt his ears like the thrust of a knife. Feared he might shriek. What he did hear was only the ticking of his watch. He unclosed his eyes and saw again the water below him. I could free my hands, he thought. I might throw off the noose and spring into that stream. By diving, I could evade the bullets and swim vigorously, reach the bank, take to the woods and get away home. My home. Thank God is as yet outside their lines. My wife and little ones are still beyond the invaders farthest in advance. The thoughts flashed into the doomed man's brain. The sergeant stepped aside. Peyton Farquhar was a well-to-do planter of an old, highly respected Alabama family. No service was too humble for him to perform. No adventure too perilous for him to undertake. If consistent with the character of a civilian who was at heart a soldier, and who in good faith and without too much qualification, assented to at least a part of the rankly villainous dictum that all is fair in love and war. One evening, while Peyton and his wife were sitting on a bench near the entrance of his grounds, a grey-clad soldier rode up to his gate and asked for a drink of water. Farquhar, Mrs. Farquhar that was, was only too happy to serve him with her own hand. While she was fetching the water, her husband approached the dusty horseman and inquired eagerly for news from the war. They are repairing the railroad, said the mayor, and are getting ready for another advance. They have reached the Owl Creek Bridge, put it in order, and built a stockade on the north bank. The commandant, had issued an order which is posted everywhere declaring that any civilian caught interfering with the railroad, its bridges, tunnels or trains, will be summarily hanged. I saw the order. How far is it to the Elk Creek Bridge? Water. About 30 miles. Is there no force on this side of the creek? Only a picket post half a mile out on the railroad and a single sentinel at this end of the bridge. Suppose a man, a uh, civilian, student of hanging should elude the picket post and perhaps get the better of the sentinel, said Peyton, smiling. What could he accomplish? The soldier reflected. I was there a month ago, he replied. I observed that the flood of last winter had lodged a great quantity of driftwood in its wooden pier at the end. The end of the bridge, says. It is now dry and would likely burn like a tinder. Peyton's wife had now brought the water, which the soldier drank. He thanked her, bowed to her husband, and rode away. 
An hour later, after nightfall, he repassed the house, going northward in the direction from which he had come. He was a scout. As Peyton fell straight downward through the bridge, he lost consciousness and was already dead. From this state, he was awakened, ages later. It seemed to him by the pain of a sharp pressure upon his throat, followed by a sense of suffocation, keen, poignant agony seemed to shoot from his neck, downward through every fiber of his body and limbs. These pains appeared to flash along well-defined lines of ramification and beat with an inconceivably rapid periodicity. They seemed like streams of pulsating fire, eating him to an intolerable temperature. As to his head, he was conscious of nothing but a feeling of fullness, congestion. These sensations were unaccompanied by thought. He had power only to feel and feeling was torment. He was conscious of motion encompassed in a luminous cloud of a luminous cloud of which he was merely the fiery heart. Then all at once with terrible suddenness the light about him shot upward with the noise of a loud splash. A frightful roaring was in his ears and all was cold and dark. The power of thought was restored. He knew that the rope had broken. He'd fallen into the fucking stream. There was no case of drowning as the rope was still tight about his neck, suffocating him and keeping the water from his lungs. To die of hanging at the bottom of a river. The idea seemed to him ludicrous. He opened his eyes in the darkness and saw above him a gleam of light. He was, he was still sinking, but the light became fainter and fainter until it was a mere glimmer. Then, it began to grow and brighten, and he, he knew he was rising. To be hanged and drowned, he thought. And it's not so bad, but I do not wish to be shot, no. I will not be fucking shot, that is not fucking fair. He was not conscious of an effort, but a sharp pain in his wrist told him that he was trying to free his own hands. He gave attention to the struggle. What a fine endeavor, bravo. The cord fell away, his arms parted and floated upwards, the hands dimly seen on each side in the glowing light. He watched them with a new interest. The first one, and then the other, pounced upon the noose at his neck. They tore it away and thrust it fiercely aside. Put it back, put it back, he thought. He shouted these words for the undoing of the noose had been succeeded by the direst pang that he had yet experienced. His neck ached horribly. His brain was on fire. His heart, which had been fluttering faintly, gave a great leap. His whole body was racked and wrenched with an insupportable anguish. But his disobedient hands gave no heed to the command. They beat the water vigorously with a quick downward stroke, forcing him to the surface. He held his head emerge. His eyes were blinded by the sunlight, his chest expanded convulsively, and with a supreme and crowning agony, his lungs engulfed a great draught of air. Instantly, he expelled it with a scream. He was now in full possession of his physical senses. They were indeed keen and fucking alert. Something in the awful disturbance of his system had so exalted and refined them that they made a record of things never before perceived. He felt it, the ripples upon his face as the look at the forest on the bank of the stream. He had come to the surface facing downstream in a, in a moment. The visible world seemed to wheel slowly. Slowly around himself as the pivotal point. And he saw the bridge, the fort, the soldiers upon the bridge, the captain, the sergeant, two privates, his executioners. They were in silhouette against the blue sky. They shouted, pointing at him. The captain had drawn his pistol but did not fire. The others were unarmed. Their movements were grotesque and horrible. Their forms gigantic. Suddenly, Peyton heard a sharp report and something struck the water smartly within a few inches of his head, spattering his face with spray. 
He heard a second report and saw one of the sentinels with his rifle at his shoulder alight. Cloud of blue smoke rising from the muzzle. The man in the water saw the eye of the man on the bridge, gazing into his own through the sights of the rifle. He observed that it was a grey eye. He remembered having read the grey, keenest, and the all famous marksman had them. Nevertheless, this one had missed. Company! Attention! Shoulder arms! Ready! Aim! Fire! Peyton dived as deeply as he could. The water roared in his ears as he heard dull thunder. The collier rising again towards the surface met shining bits of metal singularly flattened and swirly slowly down. As he rose to the surface, gasping for breath, he saw that he'd been a long time underwater. He was perceptibly farther downstream, nearer to safety. The soldiers had almost finished reloading the Metal ramrods flashed all at once in the sunshine as they were drawn from the barrel, turned in the air and thrust into their sockets. Sentinels fired again, independently and in ineffectually. A hunted man saw all this over his shoulder as he swam vigorously with the current. The officer, he reasoned, will not make that martinet's error second time. It is as easy to dodge a volley as a single shot. He probably already has given the command to fire at will, God help me. I cannot dodge them all. Suddenly, he felt himself whirled around and round, spinning like a top. The water, the banks, the forest, the now distant bridge, fort and men all were commingled and blurred. Objects were represented only by their colors. This was all he saw. He had been caught in a vortex and was being whirled on with a velocity that made him giddy and sick. In a few moments, he was flung upon the gravel at the foot of the left bank of the street. The southern bank, behind a projecting point. That projecting point concealed him from his enemy. The sudden arrest of his motion, the abrasion of one of his hands on the gravel, stored him and he wept a little with delight. He dug his fingers into the sand, threw it over himself in handsfuls and audibly blessed it. <laughs> it looked like diamonds, rubies, emeralds. He could think of nothing more fucking beautiful, which it did not resemble. Peyton was content to remain in that enchanting spot till retaken at the whiz and rattle of a gunshot amongst the branches high above his head roused him from his dream. All that day that he travelled, laying his course by the rounding sun, the forest seemed interminable. Nowhere did he discover a break in it, not even a woodman, woodman's throat. He had not known that he lived in such a wild region. There was something uncanny in the revelation. By nightfall, he was fatigued, foot sore and famished. The thought of his wife and children urging him on. At last, he found a road which led him in what he knew to be the right direction. It was as wide and straight as a city street, yet it seemed untraveled. No fields bordered it, no swelling anywhere. Not so much as the barking of a dog suggested human habitation. Black bodies of the trees formed a straight wall on both sides, terminating on the horizon in a point like a diagram in a lesson in perspective. Overhead, as he looked up through this rift in the woods, shone great golden stars looking unfamiliar and grouped in strange constellations. He was sure they were arranged in some order which had a secret and malign significance. The wood on either side was full of a singular noises, among which once, twice, and again he distinctly heard whispers, an unknown tongue. His neck was in pain and lifting his hands to it, he found it horribly swollen. He knew that it had a circle of black where the rope had bruised it. His eyes felt congested, he could no longer close them. His tongue was swollen with thirst, he 
relieved its fever by thrusting it forward from between his teeth into the cold air. How softly the turf had carpeted the untraveled avenue. He could no longer feel the roadway beneath his feet. Doubtless, despite his suffering, he had fallen asleep while walking. But now he sees another scene. Perhaps he was merely recovered from a delirium. He stood at the gate of his own home. All is as he left it, all bright and beautiful in the morning. That morning sunshine. He must have travelled the entire night. As he pushed open the gate and passed up the wide white walk, he saw a flutter of a female garment. His wife, looking fresh and cool and sweet. She stepped down from the veranda to meet him. At the bottom of the steps, she stood wait with a smile of ineffable joy. An attitude of matchless grace and dignity. How beautiful she was. He sprung forward with extended arms. As he was about to clasp her, he felt a stunning blow on the back of his neck. A blinding white light blazed all about him with a sound like the shock of a fucking cannon. Then all was dark and silent. Peyton Farquhar was dead. His body with a broken neck swung gently from side to side beneath the timbers of the Alcreek Bridge. The end.